Good morning, church. Yeah, nice to see everyone here this morning. If you can all stand as we sing our first song for today, it's Cornerstone. <laughs> song is before the throne of God above.
everyone. A very good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with you all, and it's great to come together and worship the Lord. If you're here visiting, uh, visiting with us for the first time or tuning in uh, for the first time, welcome, and we trust that God will bless you as you worship with us this morning. Now, those were brilliant hymns, weren't they? Especially that second one. I really love that second hymn, Before the Throne of God Above, especially the second verse. Uh, when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. What a wonderful truth and a wonderful assurance that if we are in Christ, our sins are done away with and no matter how guilty we might feel because of the things we've done wrong or the right things we didn't do even, Christ pleads for us. He intercedes for us at the right hand of the Father right now and there's no one who can bid us to depart from being able to come before our God, which is awesome, isn't it? What wonderful truths. In light of that, let us pray and come before the throne of grace. Father, we thank you so much that we know because you've told us in your word that we have access to this grace, the grace wherein we stand. We thank you that we can come before you, that you're a God who will not turn us away because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has already accomplished upon the cross. And we thank you that we are welcome here as your children. You want us to be here. And Father, we pray that you would please help us this morning as we seek to worship and honor Christ our Savior. Help us in the prayer, in, in the praying, in the singing, in the reading, and the preaching of your word. Help us to be challenged changed, conformed more into the image of our Savior, and help us to truly honor him in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before we begin, here's our big three, or as we begin, rather, here's our big three. Our missionary for the week that we want to think about and pray for is James Wilson. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Travis, Sam, uh, Grant, Sam, Brian, and myself, we were in Northern Ireland visiting with James Wilson. He's a good and encouraging brother. Let's pray for him because the work that he's doing in Derry, London Derry, is a hard work. Um, the people there are hard to reach, but despite that, our brother James faithfully labors and he's not easily discouraged, which is awesome. So let's remember our brother in prayer. Uh, the country that we want to pray for, the country of the week, is France with a population of 64 million plus, almost 65 million, which is a lot of people. And we don't know how many of those people are saved. We could see there that the majority of them are Catholic, but really we want to see souls saved. And so let's pray that France would um, come under conviction that souls there would be saved, that our brothers and sisters who are there would be faithful and effective in their labor. And the county for the week is Hertfordshire. Now, if you want to know more about Hertfordshire, uh, you're more than welcome to talk to Travis and Sam. They've been going up and down to Hertfordshire, doing a little bit of work there. And so please do ask them, bother them about the, the work that's going on at Hertfordshire. And let's pray that God would do a work there. Uh, we know that he's got people there, but let's pray that God would help and to build up his people in that place. All right, our weekly notices. Wednesday, 7 p.m., we have our Bible study and our youth meeting. Please do come to that if you're able to. We are continuing and still going through the book of Revelation, and it's been a blessing and continues to be a blessing. Saturday, we don't have an outreach, but instead we have our church workday. Now, I don't know what a church workday is, at least not yet, but I will be there, and I will find out. <laughs> if you want to know what a church workday is, be there, and you'll find out as well. It's from 9.30 until 1.30 p.m., and if you're not able to stay for the whole duration, that's fair enough. Even if just half an hour or an hour, you'll, your work, your help, whatever that work and help may be, is very much appreciated. So please do come along to that, or if not, then be praying. And here are some upcoming events. September 5, or September 19, first up there. September 19th, we have our church anniversary, which is awesome. So let's plan to come along to bless and be blessed by the fact that God is built up this church, that he's continuing to build it up, and let's pray that God would continue to work in and through us. So let's plan to attend the church anniversary September 5th, which is next week. We have the teacher and volunteers training at 9.45 a.m. So if you're someone who's um, a, a regular teacher here or a volunteer, please do make it for 9.45. We have a short meeting uh, before the small groups. And then some upcoming things as well. We have up on the screen coming up, the grand opening of the Colchester Mission. Praise the Lord, 
that that work is going. Praise the Lord for what he has done and is continuing to do. Now, if you've been reading the, uh, the news updates, you'll know that the work at Colchester has uh, suffered some setbacks, but the Lord has promised that he would build his church, right? And if he's going to build his church, we put our trust in him. And so now we have the grand opening happening on the 19th of September as well. So not only is it our church anniversary, but it's the grand opening of the Colchester mission. Please, if you're able to, let's attend and support and be a blessing to our brothers and our sisters up in Colchester. It's at 6 30 p.m. If you want to find out more about it, please feel free to talk to Travis, Sam, or myself about it. And then our winter retreat, the 7th to the 9th of January is the next thing on uh, the notices. Our winter retreat, please uh, plan to come to the winter retreat. It's going to be an awesome time where we as a church and the folks of Colchester can come together, come aside from our day-to-day weekly um, routines come just come aside rest a while and really have that as an opportunity to be blessed to be recharged to be refreshed so that we can go out again and continue laboring for the Lord so those are our notices uh, please turn with me to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 10 Colossians 1 and verse 10 And it says here that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So this is prayers, uh, prayers, Paul's prayer for the Colossian believers. He prayed that they would walk worthy of the Lord, that they would be pleasing, that they would be fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. And why do I bring this out? Well, as As one of your pastors, as your brother, this is my desire for you all as well, for you all to walk worthy of the Lord, for you all to grow so that you are day by day pleasing to our Lord and to be fruitful in all the work that you do. And one of the things that we believe this is, is to be givers. And again, we're not saying, you know, plant a seed so that you'll, so we're not that kind of a church, but we do believe that giving is a part of worship and we want you all, we encourage you to be worshipers in this aspect so um, our brother love day is going to come and lead us in a hymn and while the hymn's happening the men will take up the offering and afterwards um, Bo is going to come up and um, pray for the offering and do the scripture reading for us so brother love day if we can all stand please as we sing a song blessed assurance
I'm just going to pray for the offering first. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the privilege to come into your presence uh, this morning as a body of believers in Jesus Christ. And we are utterly unworthy to come before you, but in Christ we are made worthy, we are, we are made righteous. And I pray for this offering that it would go toward the furtherance of the gospel, uh, that more people would hear your word and be saved. I pray and commit the service into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to be reading uh, the passage today, which is 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1 to 10. So you can either follow along in your Bible, or the verses will be on the screen. So 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1 to 10, the Bible reads, And it came to pass, when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south, and Ziklag, and smitten Ziklag, and burned it with fire and had taken the woman captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahaniam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David, and David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. So David went, he and the six hundred men that were with him, and came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued he and four hundred men, for two hundred abode behind which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Besor. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Phil. All right, let's just pray together, and then we'll uh, get into our Bibles this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can gather together today, and thank you for uh, who you are and for all that you do for us. Thank you that you are God, uh, not just of the hills, but a God of the valleys, and uh, that you know about our pain, you know about our suffering, uh, and yet, Lord, there is hope for us in those moments. And I pray today that we would be encouraged uh, from your word and that we would learn how we, like David, can encourage ourselves in you, our God. And if there's someone here today who uh, does not know you, uh, that you are not their God, uh, because they have not believed on Jesus, that they would believe and be saved today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So just before we get into our passage, um, first of all, the work day is a lot of fun, but we do do some work. So, uh, But don't tell Ricardo that. It's mostly fun. <laughs> uh, and then also, if you would, please do mark your um, diaries for the 19th of September, um, not only for our anniversary service here, uh, which will be, I think, should be special. Should be, we'll have lunch, and then um, that evening is the grand opening for the church in Colchester. So we've been the last year working to start that church, and uh, we really want to encourage everybody that can to make plans to go. If you'd like to go, uh, but you don't have a lift, if you just let me know or Sam or Ricardo, and we will see if we can manage to do some carpooling. Um, so it will be kind of a longish day. Uh, but I know it really bless the folks there if you're able to go with us. Um, and then finally, I want to just mention um, our our country or our county of the week was Hartfordshire, which is 
uh, quite interesting because we are um, praying about helping get a church started there maybe sometime this autumn. So if you just keep that in your prayers, the Lord's opened a lot of uh, doors for us and we want to do all we can to go through them. So, okay, so our passage this morning, David and his men, um, last week Ricardo uh, talked about how that, uh, what was the title of your message last week? When God saves you from yourself. And so basically what happens was that David uh, has allied himself with the Philistines. And for 18 months he lives near them, which is puts him in a compromised position. Because when they go off to war against the Israelites, they expect that David will now go with them. And so he's now in this position where he has been relying on the Philistines for security but now they're going to fight his own people. But then God intervenes, and he's not, he doesn't have to go to war against his own people. But verse number 1, the Bible says, It came to pass when David and his men are come to Ziklag on the third day. So they had marched for three days north, and now they've marched three days south back to where they were living. The Bible says that the Amalekites had invaded the south, and Ziklag, where David's family and all the families of his men were, and had smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire, and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew them not, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So I don't know if you can imagine coming back, and some may have even had this experience, but you've been away and you come back, and as you get close to home, Rather than seeing your home, you see smoke. And your house has been burned to the ground. Imagine the feeling. And what's even more uh, terrible is that these men's families were not with them. And they're thinking, what has happened to our home? What has happened to our wives? What has happened to our children? What has happened? And so we see, first of all, if you want to write down in your Bibles... We see terrible, not or in your notes, terrible tragedy. Terrible tragedy. Now, just a little bit of a backstory is quite interesting to study out the Amalekites. So the Amalekites were a group of people who inhabited the southern region of Canaan. And uh, we first see them in Exodus chapter 17 when Israel was coming out of Egypt to the promised land that they... Um, fought against Israelites. And there was a battle, if you remember, where as long as Moses held up uh, the, the, uh, his staff, his, uh, the, the rod of God, the, the battle went in the favor of the Israelites. But when his hands grew heavy, then they began to lose. Does, you guys remember that story? So the group of people they were fighting were the Amalekites. And so God uh, was upset with them for stopping his people uh, on their journey into Canaan. They were uh, a very wicked and idolatrous group of people. And so God then later would command King Saul to utterly destroy the Amalekites. That was in 1 Samuel chapter 15. And this is another well-known story because what happened there was God told Saul to go utterly destroy them. Do you remember what Saul did? He saved the best of the uh, of the flocks and the livestock, he spared the king, and he comes back, and uh, Samuel says, you know, what is the meaning of the bleeding of the sheep, and Saul begins to make excuses, well, you know, I really wanted to do the right thing, but it was these people, and from that moment, then God says, basically, that your kingdom's not going to last, uh, but apparently, others were spared as well, because now we have an entire band of, you know, soldiers coming. Uh, we're going to see later on, probably won't be till next week, that a remnant escapes, but a remnant of the Amalekites escaped. There was 400 of them. So how many Amalekites did Saul leave around? And because he didn't obey God, uh, they became a continual thorn in the side of Israel. Now there's a, another connection later on with the Amalekites that, again, is very interesting. How many of you remember the story of Esther? 
Remember that story in the Bible? And there was a, uh, who was the evil guy that was trying to get her uncle Mordecai killed and all the Jews? Anybody remember his name? He started with an H. Haman. Haman. And, uh, and Haman was an Agagite, which is a bit of a mouthful. But King Agag was king of the Amalekites. So Haman, the evil guy that wanted to wipe out the Jews, descended from the Amalekites. So it's just a, it's a very um, graphic lesson of what happens when we disobey God. Saul didn't obey God. He just thought there's no need to have total obedience. And he leaves around a group of people that come and attack David's families. And later on, we'll have a plot to try to wipe out all the Jews. And of course, God intervenes. Uh, but um, so that's the Amalekites. They invade the south uh, where David is living and they burn it with fire and they take all of the women. Uh, verse four says also, or verse three says also their sons and daughters and take them away captives. Now their plan, they haven't killed their families, but very likely their plan is to sell them as slaves. And to be honest, their fate was probably a fate almost worse than death. Um, and so this is extremely uh, tragic and terrible thing that has happened uh, to David and his men. So we come down to verse 3 and we notice that when David and his men come to the city, behold, it was burned with fire. Their wives, their sons, their daughters were taken captives. So then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. So here's David and his battle-hardened men who've just done a six-day march uh, come back. But now I think it's interesting in verse 4. In verse 3, they're called men. In verse 4, they're called people. And they're, they're, they're heartbroken. And they begin to weep and to wail. And, you know, I'm, I don't know. I think most men don't like loads and loads of tears and crying. Women seem to have no trouble with it. My, me and Grant... Uh, occasionally the girls want to watch something and and we don't want to watch whatever they're watching and then we'll like come in early and they're just like they're just it's like what did what happened oh, you know last it was happened last night and you're like you don't have to watch it no we like it you know so you know women seem to don't mind tears as much but but it's terrible if you see uh and very uncomfortable you see men cr crying you know so you think the grown men these these warriors and they are but they are just crushed, and they are they are they are crying, and weeping to the point that they have no more power to weep. David's people are heartbroken. His wives, verse five, they have been taken: Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. Nabal had passed on. This is kind of a weird way to phrase. You know, this is my wife, the wife of someone else. Uh, but he had died, and then David married her. But then verse 6 says, David was greatly distressed. So it's affected his people. It's affected him. Why was he greatly distressed? Well, even to add insult to injury, now the people begin to talk about stoning David because they are so grieved for their families. Now they do what we often do, when we are in trouble, uh, we begin to turn on one another and we begin to blame one another and they begin to think, we need to get David. If it wasn't for David, we wouldn't be in this situation. And David overhears this. And so you think about the trouble they're going through, but you think about David. I mean, David has had it tough for a long time. He has been running for his life. He has been... Um, uh, hiding out with the enemy and now the people want to turn on him and want to stone David. So there was terrible tragedy that happens here. And you know, when you think about the people in the Bible and you read their stories, we often hear about the miracles or we hear about the blessings. We hear about the woman, you remember, who had one last little cruise of oil and one last little bit of flour and the prophet came and said feed, feed me first and she says you know uh, well I was just going to feed me and my son and then we were going to die and he's like well let me eat first and so she does that 
And then she goes and gets all of her pots and borrows, and then God just fills it. And you're like, man, that's, that's what I'm talking about. That's what being a Christian's all about right there, is that God just pours it out on you. But when you read their stories, you also often, we look over the times of suffering. Think about Joseph. Think about Moses. Think about the disciples. To follow Jesus means that we're going to have to pick up our cross and to deny ourselves and be willing to go through some tough things. And David, King David, he knew about trouble. He knew about tragedy. He knew about the hard things that, uh, of life. And we're going to face it. And you may be in it. You may be coming out of it. You may be heading into it. But we have to stop being surprised uh, by trouble and difficulty. One Peter uh, talks about, you know, not being... I'm trying to think of the way it puts it, but it basically says, you know, don't think it's strange. Don't think it's odd or unusual to go through difficulty. We always do. It's sort of like traffic in London. There's traffic. Where did this traffic come from? You know, we thought there was going to be no traffic. You're in London, you know. I, I remember when we first moved to London, we were meant to go to a birthday party, and we just put it in the, in the, the uh, sat-nav or the GPS I can't remember which one is called here, but we put it in there and it said 35 minutes, an hour and 35 minutes we landed. The birthday party was like over and we were embarrassed, you know, because we didn't anticipate, but we're surpri surprised by it. But we shouldn't be surprised by it. We shouldn't be surprised by trouble and by trial and by tragedy. We live in a broken world filled with broken people. We ourselves are needing God to help us and change us. So there's going to be tragedy, and David is going through it, and we are probably going through it or have gone through it or will go through it. But notice verse number six, and this leads us to our second point, truthful encouragement. Notice what happens in verse number six, and this is, this is a great phrase. It's a great verse, and it is a, it is a great principle and discipline for us in our lives. Verse number six says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Now, you think about this, it almost sounds like, it almost sounds meaningless. It's sort of like you're in all this difficulty and someone come, comes along and says, oh, cheer up. You're like, how? Why? How do I just, you know, how do I lift myself up by my own bootstraps and just, you know, oh, it's going to be good. It's, you know, what did David do? I mean, he doesn't know where his, his wives are. He doesn't know where his children are. He doesn't know where the wives of his men are and where their children are. For all they know, they're being tortured or murdered or sold into slavery. They don't know where they've taken them. Now his own guys are, are thinking, you know what? It's his fault. So what does he do? How does he encourage himself? How does he go from being at the bottom to being able to be encouraged once again? And if we could try to answer that question, it would help us. Because sometimes our issue is not what others are, are doing for us or not doing for us. It's an it's a internal thing we have to work through. People can try to come along and say, it's going to be okay, and I understand, and I've been there, and you'll get through it. But that doesn't always help us. We have to figure out how to encourage ourselves in the Lord our God. So what does that mean, and how does he do it? Well, I'm, gonna, I'm going to um, speculate a little bit, but show you other verses that I think we can learn from David because it doesn't actually say how he does it. But there's things we can bring from other passages that I think will help us in this. So how did David encourage himself in the Lord his God? Well, the first thing is that no doubt he poured out his situation to the Lord in prayer. Do you think that would be a bit of a stretch to say that he probably prayed? I don't think it would be, especially when you consider... You have the entire book of Psalms, which is 150 different prayers. So I want to look at one of those. I want to look at Psalm 27. So if you turn your Bibles to Psalm 27, we're going to use this 
actually for all three of my points under this question. How did David encourage himself? The first thing is prayer. Now, this we don't know when this prayer was prayed. But if you read the things that he prays and the things that he says, it was certainly written and prayed in a similar time to what David is going through. So let's just read down through it and read this and think about David and think about him praying these things. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Now, actually, as we go through it, why don't we do uh, like a responsive type reading? So every other verse, we all read together, okay? That way I know you guys are awake and you're, you're reading with me, okay? So I've done the first one. Now let's read the second one together. Ready? Verse 2. When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. Next verse together. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in His temple. For in the time of trouble He shall hide me in His pavilion. In the secret of His tabernacle he sh shall He hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in His tabernacles sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me, and answer me. When thou said, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me, put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help, leave me not. Neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty." I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and He shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Now that, I don't know, as I said, whether that was what he prayed whenever he was in the ashes, alone, you know, being turned on by his own men, but I think that'd be a really good thing to pray at a time like that. I don't know about you. So he prayed. And when we feel down, when we feel alone, when terrible tragedy hits us, we can turn to God in prayer. And we can call out to God in prayer. And one of the things that's great about the Psalms is the Psalms teach us how to pray. And the Psalms are not always uh, written in, in typical prayers. Lord, we just thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you've done. Bless everybody and help, you know, just help everybody to have a great day. Amen. Sometimes it's like, God, I'm mad. God, I'm, I'm frustrated. How long, oh God, will you let this go on? So what we have to learn to do is we have to learn to talk honestly to the Lord. We have to, and one of the best ways to do it is just use the Psalms. Let the Psalms guide you because you know if you're praying, if you're, you take a Psalm and you turn it into something that you personally pray to God and you pray that back to God. So I think no doubt David got alone with God and he began to pray. And he's, he's got all these problems, but he's now talking to God. And there is nothing like getting alone with God and 
and, and just talking to God about it and pouring out your heart to God and, and casting all your cares upon the Lord, knowing, I mean, sometimes it's good just to talk to people. Sometimes it's good just to, uh, Sam and I were on a, on a drive the other day and we were both annoyed about something and we both just kind of like shared our frustrations. I don't know if that was necessarily the, the right thing to do, but we, we were like, okay, we got that out of our system. You know, we, he might have, we might have had to go home and both repent. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just sometimes good to talk to somebody, know that somebody else is hearing you out and listening, but God is the one that we should be talking to. Because he's the one that can really do something about it. So prayer. Secondly, his prayers certainly included reminding himself of what is true about the Lord his God. If you remember, it said David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. So the idea here is that he is thinking about God. He's thinking about the Lord, and he's thinking about the Lord who is his God. So let's go back through Psalm 27 again. If this was the thing that he prayed, here are some things that he could have been reminding himself. Or if we face with tragedy, what could this psalm teach us? As he's praying, Lord, you are my light and my salvation. I'm in darkness, but you're my light, Lord. I'm despairing, but you, you are my salvation. I'm not going to fear. I don't know where the Amalekites are right now. I don't know what my guys are going to do to me, but I'm not going to be afraid. And Lord, you are my strength. My lo- I, I have strength for life, but you are the strength of my life. I'm not, I don't live because everything's good. I live because I know the Lord. He gives strength for living. So therefore, who shall I be afraid? Verse 2. When the wicked, mine enemies, my foes, come up upon me to eat my flesh, they stumbled and fell. He's remembering all the times God has already delivered him. He's, He's in a tough spot, but he's been in tough spots before. And he's like, Lord, you delivered me before. I had foes, I had wicked enemies that were trying to get me. But they've fallen, they've stumbled before, they will stumble again. Verse 3. Uh, what does he say there, verse 3? Though a host, a whole army, that's what a host is. He said, even if an entire army camps against me, my heart will not fear. He's like, he's preaching to himself. He's praying, but he's preaching to himself. And he's, he says, the war would rise against me. And this, I will be confident. You know what I want right now, verse 4? Oh, if I could have anything of you, Lord. There's one thing I really, really want, and that is to dwell in the house, Lord, all the days of my life. For years, David had been unable to go to the temple to pray. And he said, man, if I could just go to the house of the Lord. I remember how beautiful you were, Lord. I remember what it was like to go to your temple. And he's like, Lord, that's the thing I want right now. I want you, God. I want to know you. I want to talk to you. I want to, I want to know that you are with me. See what's happening here? His focus is being taken off of his problems and the tragedy and the difficulty and himself and his friends. And he's like, God, I just need to get close to you again. In the time of trouble, I know that you will hide me in your pavilion. You'll put me in in the secret of your tabernacle, and you will set me upon a rock. Now my head will be lifted up above mine enemies round about. I will offer uh, in your tabernacle sacrifice of joy. I will sing. He's like, one day I'm going to get through this, and I'm going to write a song about this. And I'm going to sing about this. We're going to win this, God. You are going to lift me up. You are going to give me the victory. But right now, verse 7, Lord, I need you to hear me. I need you to hear because I am crying out. I do not know what to do. So have mercy and answer me. You, You told me to seek your face. 
And so I said, Lord, that's what I'm going to do. Lord, you give me promises in your word. You told me that I have not because I asked not. And I'm asking you right now. And I'm saying, God, I need you right now, right here in this, in this moment. Hide not your face from me. Put not your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will... David was all alone. He had no one at this moment. Even when those that are nearest and dearest, when they forsake, he said, Lord, I know you'll take me up. So teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Do not deliver me over to the will of mine enemies. They want to crush me. They want to consume me. There are liars out there. There are false witnesses that rise up against me, and they're breathing out cruelty. So what he is doing is he's praying, but he's also like preaching to himself. And he is proclaiming the promises of God. He is reminding himself of the, all the times that God has spared him. He is appealing to the character of God. And he is reminding himself of what is true about the Lord is God. You know, really for us, that the best way to do that is to get in, in this book right here. Because life and circumstances in this world can cause a lot of confusion. And a lot of lies and a lot of emotions and a lot of other things. Honestly, even within a 24-hour period, you can begin to get off, off focus. But when you open up this book right here, you're reminded there is a God. And he's the light in our salvation. So he's reminding himself of what is true. I don't know if he had a copy of the, of you know what it, whatever Bible was written then, but he certainly knew what God said, and he knew who God was. So he prays. He reminds himself of what is true, and then thirdly, no doubt, as he prayed, he chose to believe and live based upon what is true, not what he was feeling. And this is quite important. He chose to believe and to live based upon what is true and not what he was feeling. He encourages himself, and Lord, he rises up out of the ashes, and he's ready to go again. He didn't go anywhere. He didn't have anyone come visit him. He didn't have a sudden message like, oh, hang on a minute, it's all going to be okay. Just read 1 Samuel chapter 30. He didn't have that. But he just, in those moments, I don't know how long it was, whether he went for a walk, whether he got down on his knees, but he got time with God and he poured out his heart to God and he, and he remembered who God was. And then he said, you know what? If, if these things are true and there is, there is a God in heaven and he's my God, I can go on. And I am going to live, and I'm going to believe based upon what is true, not what I'm feeling. I'm sure in the pit of his stomach, he was thinking, where's my wife? Where's my kids? I don't know what's happened to them. I, don't, I feel terrible. I've, I've, I've led all these men out here into this place, and they've all lost their families. But he's like, I'm not going to let that control the way I live, because I know there's a God. And I know that He can help me. And I know that He is with me. And I know that He has promised to deliver me. And that He has delivered me many times before. He has saved me. I will live based upon these truths. So uh, let's look at the last two verses of Psalm 27. He says, I had fainted. I almost gave up. I almost couldn't go on unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. David said, I, I almost gave up, but then I believed that there was a God and He's good and there's the land of the living. For David, David had real promises that he was going to be king. So David could not fail. We don't have quite the same promises about this life, but we have promises about the next life, don't we? We know there's a land of the living and it's heaven. That's our promises. So even if the worst happens and we lose our life for Christ, there is a land of eternal life, of everlasting life, and all that believe and trust in Jesus are going to be there in that good place. 
we cannot lose. We cannot fail. It all does turn out in the end for the child of God because there is a God in heaven. And when we feel like fainting, let's believe to see the goodness of the Lord and the land of the living. Verse number 14 now, he says, Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and He will strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. I don't know if he's talking to himself, if he's talking to others. I think he's sort of, maybe he's talking out loud. He's like, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. Have some courage, David. Get it together, man. The Lord is going to come through. So man up now because there's a God in heaven. He's on the throne. There's a land of the living. He's a good God. Can do this because God is helping me. He's going to strengthen my heart, and I'm just going to wait. I'm going to, the idea is not I'm just going to sit and do nothing. It's I'm going to rely on the Lord. I'm trusting in the Lord. So that's, so, so the guys that are about to stun him are like, whoa. He was a broken man. He was a confused man. He was a distressed man. I think he was probably weeping with the best of them. And these, these, these warrior men are broken, and suddenly David says, where's the prophet? So let's come to the last thing, and that's tenacious courage. Because what happens here is faith in God gives David courage to go on. So come back in your Bibles to 1 Samuel 30, and let's look at verse number 7. After verse 6, where David encouraged himself in the Lord his God, David is ready to go. And he says to Abiathar, the priest, Ahimelech's son, he says, would you please bring the ephod? The ephod was the high priest's apron-like garment that contained in the breastplate the Urim and the Thummim, which was some way that they could discern the will of God. And David is now inquiring of the Lord. Look at verse number 8. And David inquired at the Lord. So from a distressed man to saying, we can go on, he begins by being back to inquiring of the Lord. Now that was something we saw earlier on with David, but then we didn't read much about it. And several of the chapters that have happened recently, uh, when he goes down to lives of the Philistines, we don't read about him inquiring of the Lord. And he gets himself in a lot situations that are not so good. But now he's back to inquiring of the Lord. He's like, I'm ready. What's next, God? What's the next step? And he inquires and he says, should I go after this troop? Should I overtake them? And God answers and says, pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them and without fail recover all. And so David went and he and the 600 men that were with him and came to the brook Basor, where, where those that were left behind stayed. And David pursued, he and 400 men, for 200 men abode behind, which were so faint they could not go on. I mean, these guys have been marching for at least six days straight. Three days up, three days back. I don't know if you, we, we went um, camping this summer. We did like a 16-mile walk in one day. And, you know, I thought we were going to die at the end of it. Um, you know, but that was only one day. Imagine doing 20 miles a day for six days in a row, and then, and then you come back and you have to go another couple days to catch up with a whole army of several hundred, and, and David is pursuing now. It's so difficult, 200 guys, they can't go on. It's like, we cannot go any further. He's like, all right, you stay here with all the extra stuff. The 400 of us are going to go on. And you'll have to come back next Sunday to find out what happens. <laughs> but what we see is that because he encouraged himself in the Lord, he had the courage to pray and to seek God's direction. He had the courage to keep pursuing no matter how difficult it is. Great courage comes from great faith. And we have to work at encouraging ourselves in the Lord so that we will want to seek God's direction and so that we will keep going for God. I mean, if, we get discour if you get discouraged, 
you're going to want to give up. But if you're encouraged, you keep going. And so we have to learn to get into God's Word and to pray and to, and to believe what God says so that we can keep going for the Lord. And it's not something that others can do for us. We can encourage one another and we should try, but it needs to be the type of encouragement that says, look to the Lord. Get in the Word. This is what the Bible says. God's going to help you. I'm praying for you. It has to be rooted in something beyond just little like platitudes and little like nice cliches. It has to be in the Lord our God. Just a couple quick verses. We're about done. 2 Timothy 2 verses 1 to 3. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things I have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who should be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. How do we endure hardness? If we go back to verse 1, we are strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. There's a verse in the Bible that talks about being strengthened with might in our inner man. So we have to work at uh, be encouraged in the Lord so we can keep moving forward. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2 to 3, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Look at verse 3. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. So if we're going to keep pursuing, we have to keep encouraging ourselves in the Lord. The contrast between David and King Saul could not have been greater. And if you remember 1 Samuel chapter 28, what did Saul do when he got to the end in super distress? Where did he go? He went to the witch at Endor. And he, instead of encouraging himself in the Lord, he went to the complete opposite direction. And a lot of people, they might not go to a witch, but they go to all sorts of other worldly and ungodly things. Oh, I'm really down. I, I'll just, uh, you know, I'll just do this. I'll, I'll, tr I'll try this. I'll use this substance to artificially give me some, some courage or just I'll, I'll get involved in this activity because it'll just make me feel chilled and relaxed. And, and if I can just have a bit of me time, then I'll, then I'll be good. But what happened to Saul when he, when he went to the witch? He was even more broken than before he got there. He's so weak, he can't even get off the ground. She has to make him food so he can just, you know, uh, limp out of their house to go off to battle and he dies there. But David, he doesn't turn to the world. He doesn't turn to, the, to, to sinful pleasures and other things. He turns to God and he's able to march for several more days and recover all because he was looking to the Lord, not this world, to give him the strength that he needed. There could not have been a greater contrast so where do you go for courage? And where do I go for courage? We will all face terrible and difficult times. We will all feel overwhelmed by the challenges and the hurts and the fears of this world. The question is not, will we face difficulty, but what will we do when we face it? If you're a Christian or non-Christian, you're going to face tough stuff. But as a Christian, we should be looking to the Lord our God not this world for encouragement. You can only find courage and be encouraged in the Lord if He is your God. David said, encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. David already had a relationship with God. David already knew God. And do you know God? Is the Lord your God? I didn't ask whether the Lord was your parents' God, or your culture's God, but is the Lord your God? Do you know Him? Does He know you? Have you believed on Jesus Christ and come to God through Jesus? The same God that David had can and will be your God if you will believe on Him. John chapter 14, verse 1, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus saith to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If you've never believed on Jesus Christ as your Savior and trusted in Him to save you, then the truth of the matter is 
you really don't know God. You may know about God. You may be aware of God. But the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And if you reject Him, you are still in rejection against God. And God is not your God. But if you've believed on Jesus, then He is your God, and He will help you. And I hope that if you've never believed on Christ, that you would believe on Him today. And if you're discouraged, if you're facing tragedy and trouble, you would like David, get alone with God, pour out your heart, get in His Word, remind yourself of what is true, and choose to live based upon what the Bible says about God, not the way you're feeling. Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We're thankful that we have the privilege of having the opportunity to know you. And God, I pray for people here today who may feel like David, facing in the midst of terrible tragedy and trouble. Lord, I pray you'd help them. I pray that we would try to help one another, but ultimately, God, only you can really meet us in our in our hearts. And I pray you would encourage people today. I pray that those who do not really know you as their God would believe on you. And for Christians, God, who may feel broken and empty and distressed and, and overwhelmed, that they would not faint, but they would believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. They would put their focus on you and find the courage that you can give and the strength that you can give. Help us, God, I pray. Jesus' name, amen. Um, well, uh, Love Day is going to lead us in our final song, and then we're just going to pray at the end for all the, the students that are heading off to school or uni soon uh, at the end of the service. But Love Day, if you want to come lead us in our closing song, and then at the end we'll have a closing prayer with all the students. Let's rise and sing. So if we could have the, uh, I'll take that one there. Okay. If we could have the, uh, any of the young people that are going to school this week or next or the week after, come on up to the platform. You can be seated. Um, I'm going to ask Ricardo to pray here just a minute for you guys. So come on, guys. I know this is your, what you've all been waiting for. Come on, guys. All of you back there. Sam, you're going to uni in a few weeks. Jerome, come on. Uh, love day. You, you're too old for this. <laughs> come on up here. So, um, who else? Who else hiding out? We've got, probably got ones back here. Should we get them real quick? Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. If you go get them there, Love Day, we'll bring, bring all them out. This will get more exciting. Um, and you guys can just all stand there kind of awkwardly. <laughs> so, who starts this week? Anybody start this week? Yeah, Jerome. Next week? In a month? Next week. Okay. Come on up, Boomy. We're just getting everybody who's going to school. To, we're going to pray for you guys. So, <laughs> Yeah, go, go on up there. Stand up there. Is, is there anyone else going to school? We're going to pray for them all. Yeah, or, yeah. if you want to have them come out. It's as well organized as you can see. It was my fault. Is she going to school? Or he? Sorry. Uh, too young for school. Okay. Okay. All right. Ricardo, pray for everybody as uh, they go to. Oh, is Bella back there? So, okay, hang on. Jamie's not come out either. Oh. 
All right, great. You guys want to join them up there? Because we're just praying for, go stand over there with Callie. Look at this. This is great. All right, let's. them anything right and so we commit them to you and ask in your grace and in your mercy won't you please preserve and keep them father won't you please help them to stand against the wiles of the the devil and the evil one father we ask that you would please help these children be grounded in the truth of who you are what you've said what you've done what you've promised and like what we've learned from this morning's message may these children encourage themselves in the lord because they're going to be facing tough times they're going to face hard times father they are going to go through troubles it's part of living life as fallen sinful beings in a fallen world we thank you that it's not always going to be like this we look forward to a restoration when the lord jesus comes but until then we know that it's going to be difficult and so father we pray that these children would remember that you are their shield not just a shield but their shield you're there to protect them but Father, may they remember that you are their glory. Help them to not chase after the glory and the riches of this world, but to pursue godliness there. And Father, we know that you are the lifter up of their heads. We know that when they do get discouraged, they can turn to you, and you will encourage them and lift up their heads. But Father, we know that you're a God who hears the cry of your people. And so when these children cry unto you, may you hear them and not be um, callous or careless for about their cries of help but father hear them and answer them according to your will and be pleased to rescue them because it's who you are you are savior you are rescuer you are redeemer and so our great shepherd won't you please shepherd these children we commit them to you in jesus name amen all right give them a round of applause well done standing up there all right thank you very much for coming uh have a good week and, uh, and, and God bless you. Thanks for being here today.